Kyle. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me to this workshop. I'm actually very happy to kind of be able to do this. I'm very much into the STEM um, and to kind of helping out kids and teachers whenever possible to actually get into STEM because I'm a very happy to say a nerd. Um, and so happy to share that with everybody <laughs> and you know very willing to have more into my field. Um, so yes, as I, as I said, uh, I'm the Floating Technology Manager at TNBW North America. Um, how I actually got here is kind of a crazy journey and that's what I wanted to present to you very quickly. Um, what it actually started with was an event called Meet the Fleet. Um, it's an event that the Navy puts on at different ports around the US and you can actually go on ship tours, submarine tours, uh, and just ask all the crewmen a bunch of questions. Uh, and what triggered it for me was that it was crazy to me that airplanes could land on something that's supposed to float and how big and how heavy these were and could actually float in the ocean. Um, so that actually is kind of what started to get me into my field. Uh, from then, I went on to different science fairs, uh, especially community science fairs. Um, that just had, you know, it just helped answer a lot of questions and actually sparked a lot more. Um, and so that drove me really into Florida Atlantic University uh, with ocean and resources, resource engineering. Um, I learned everything from ship design to looking at shipwrecks to marine mammal acoustics. Um, and it actually sparked uh, renewable energy uh, for me as well. Um, and so that's when I got really started into offshore wind. So I'm not really much into the wind turbine itself, but how to make it float. And so that's the last photo that you see here. Um, okay, and then how I actually came to EMBW North America and who we really are. Um, so EMBW is actually a German utility company. They're branching out into North America. Uh, in Germany, they they have over 5 million uh, customers uh, in the EU. They generate over 14 gigawatts, uh, which is very considerable amount. Um, and their business segment actually ranges from actually selling it to the, the general people, to maintaining grids, uh, to providing the power in the form of renewable energy, and also doing um, trading and and kind of fun stuff like that. <laughs> um, but where EMBW comes in, especially in regards to renewable energy and to the US, is actually in the offshore wind production. Um, for example, to kind of give you a better grip, um, one of the farms that EMBW has in Germany currently, it's 330 megawatts, but what that actually means is power for 50,000 homes. Uh, and that's only one of the farms. Um, the farms actually get bigger. Um, right now they're planning on a one gigawatt farm, so three times as many homes. Um, and that's really what they're working to do. And while EMBW is actually kind of special is that they provide jobs and everything from the design of these farms uh, to working on the wind farm, to maintaining, um, to transmission. And so EMBW North America, um, is working to really bring this offshore renewable market uh, to the U.S. Uh, and to set up to set up here. Um, so, what is offshore wind? Uh, you already got some of this uh, in the past presentation, but I'll just go over it pretty quickly. Um, so, the reason why we like offshore wind is it's a huge energy resource, um, close to very high demand areas, as you'll see in the next slide. Uh, this energy would be American-made in energy. Um, it's, it is a new industry, so what that means is it'll create a lot of new jobs that some are currently in the market, some, some new jobs haven't even been heard of in the market. Um, and it will create a lot of local jobs from all of, on all of our coastlines, which is, uh, which is great. Um, it's reliable energy. So what that means, and I don't know if any of y'all have experience with renewable energies, but a lot of them, um, 
it's a, at a constant price. So uh, your energy bill, you know, sometimes it fluctuates uh, month per month. Um, like the price per kilowatts with renewable energies, it would be a constant energy. Um, it's working on becoming a very affordable pricing. Um, it does help fight climate change and it's, it's renewable, so it will it'll always be there. Um, so yeah, so this is, you know, this is the same interval graph that y'all saw before. So the graph that you see on your left is wind resources along the U.S. coastline. Um, you can actually see for pretty much most of our coast, we have very good, the, the energy resource that you want, or the wind resource that you want is purple, um, purple or higher. Um, so you, and you can actually see for most of our coast, we have a pretty good resource. But what's uh, pretty awesome as well, uh, as you look to the right, you can actually see kind of a representation of the large energy uses centers just by the light density. Um, and what's in kind of light blue here is actually proposed wind farm locations. So those are the ones that are proposed right now. Um, these are only fixed, and these are the ones only for the next two years. Um, in the coming years, they're, they're planning to be a lot more. Uh, okay, so as I said before, you know, EMBW is really looking to answer the wind energy demand across the US and what's available. Um, right now, um, to give you an example, only 82 gigawatts is installed in the US for wind energy. It's 84,000 homes. Um, that's not a lot. It, it is a lot, but comparatively to the energy demand of the US, it's not a lot. But the good thing is, is that everybody is predicted that it will grow, especially you know, very quickly in the years to come. Um, so in 2030, it's over 200,000 homes. Um, by 2050, it's expected to be over 400,000 homes. Um, and so what this actually means uh, and how it actually applies to teachers um, is that we're going to need people to actually have the technical skills, have the ability to design, maintain, um, and get the power to homes that we need. Um, so there's actually a large gap that's coming up that a lot of people have noticed. Um, where, where we need, you know, skilled workers, um, and engineers, uh, to actually help, to help make this a reality. Um, so a little bit more into kind of the careers needed, um, tried to separate these out. Uh, so a lot of offshore careers, um, are needed, everything from an oceanographer, um, people who will survey fish or people who will take uh, environmental data, such as the waves, uh, wind, everything like this. Uh, we do need fishermen uh, as well. I know it's not <laughs> super technical, but uh, fishermen, we need boat captains, we need uh, installers to help us actually put these things out into the water. Um, one thing you might not think of is electricians uh, and electrical engineers. Um, wind turbine mechanics, uh, port operators, um, all of these are really needed uh, in an offshore demand and will become in high demand in the years coming. Um, more onshore is academics. Um, we need a lot of offshore training centers and we need more programs that actually educate people what is a wind turbine, uh, how do you maintain a wind turbine? How would you design it? How would you design the foundation for a wind turbine? Um, everything from ships to just how to design it safely to actually accessing these things safely. Um, so we need a lot of training programs and centers. Um, onshore career, which is me. Uh, I'm an ocean engineer that gets seasick, so I'm very happy onshore. Um, we still need electricians. Um, our one thing most people don't think of is um, our grid is is actually very old um, and needs to be updated to handle kind of the new influx of power that would come from wind. So we need more people that can do power transmission, people who can 
um, do the electrical design and things like this. Um, what's also advancing is cable engineers, mooring engineers. Um, these are the guys that make sure when you have a floating platform offshore, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, and also you have the cable engineers which put the power back from this offshore wind farm onto shore. Um, naval architects like myself, um, you see the photos kind of, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, these are modeling simulations of just some of the floating offshore wind that we have now. Um, and so it kind of leads me, naval architects, mechanical, all of these specialties really that I mentioned here, um, a lot of them did use numerical models and simulations to ensure that it's safe and to ensure that, you know, how to actually physically design it. Um, and so that also leads to programmers and computer scientists um, that, that are very much in need. Um, one thing, uh, teachers, I definitely don't envy you <laughs> because you're teaching students uh, for jobs that we don't even know are needed yet. Um, this is a new field. Uh, offshore wind is more popular in Europe, but in the US it is new. So, so we, do, we do know we need jobs. We may not know exactly what all the jobs are yet, especially as technology advances. Um, Technology is developing at a faster rate than we've ever seen before. Uh, so a lot of my job actually is computer programming. Um, and it's actually working and understanding the new technologies and being able to keep up with the field. And that's why I actually like STEM because what it starts to teach and instill in people is to ask how, why, uh, you know, the, ask the right questions on how to advance and to how to understand what technology is coming out. So just to kind of give you, I pulled up some fun uh, statistics actually um, on how fast technology is changing. 40% um, of the world has access to internet. Um, 127 devices are connecting to the web every second. And my favorite one, which is most surprising, is 90% of the world's data was generated in the past two years. Um, so I mean, these are these are just some of the the fun ones that I pulled from offline. Um, but you can just see how quickly it's advancing. Um, to help with this, um, I wanted to kind of give some advice uh, because really, what is needed is you have to go to college to kind of enter into a lot of these training programs um, or you know technical just technical colleges or four years degrees, depending on which route these kids want to take. Um, being in America, we all know these are very expensive. Um, so I wanted to kind of offer some of my tricks of the trade and how I got through college without massive debt. Um, really encourage students to look at scholarships. It should really be the first place um, before loans. Um, what I noticed when I went through school, a lot of the scholarships don't require straight A's, so it can be available to kind of a wider range of students. Um, scholarships are provided a lot by schools, but they're also provided by professional societies. Uh, and so what I mean by this, professional societies are available for almost any division of engineering um, or kind, kind of anything um, really you have um, for example you have society of women engineers you have offshore engineers you have IEEE which is electrical you have civil engineers you have computer programmers so it's just a professional society and the whole goal of a professional society is to promote their field um, and to help people in their field and so what that actually means is they give tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships with kind of very simple um, applications to students, especially if they're going into their field. Um, and so th they're also, these professional societies typically have conferences or are willing to sponsor students to go to conferences. And so um, these societies, they teach networking, they, they're there to help students and actually very few students apply. Um, a lot of my, 
money to pay for college came from professional societies. Um, and interesting fact is that uh, I was actually, one of the scholarships I applied for, they actually wrote me a note and said, hey, you're actually going to get two grand more uh, because not as many students as we calculated applied. So we're divvying up this additional money to all of the students who won. So I highly encourage you, especially if you have students going into colleges, um, to look up professional societies. Um, I actually got one from the Daughters of the American Revolution as well. So there are professional societies everywhere um, that are very willing to help and, and help students pay for college. Um, the other thing I'd really like to impress upon is internships and apprenticeships. Um, Try to get them to start as soon as possible. Um, it's great. Typically, the money is horrible or free. Uh, luckily, in STEM, most of the time you get paid. Um, but you get exposure to research. You get um, great references from a professor who knows you. And typically, a lot of these professors um, have a lot of good contacts out in the field. Um, and you just get hands-on experience where a lot of kids can learn better. Um, so that's something I highly recommend, uh, as well as conferences, as I mentioned before, um, there are conferences pretty much that span the entire STEM range as well. Google is a great help at finding all of these. Um, normally it's university students, uh, but if you volunteer at these conferences, it probably can apply for high schoolers as well. Um, if you apply at these conferences and volunteer, most of the time, They'll allow certain, a certain number of students to attend the conference for free if you volunteer. Um, and so that's actually how I attended a lot of my conferences <laughs> for when I was a student. Um, but it's great. You get to hear new ideas. You get to meet other students. Um, create a great network and just kind of talk to a lot of professionals. And that really helps. Um, and one of the biggest points is typically um, STEM fields because of what they are, because they make, they, they help, they're paid, sorry. They, they um, a lot of the STEM fields offer advanced degrees for free or paid. Um, so for example, uh, my favorite thing to say is that I was paid to go to Hawaii, which is true. It's not paid a lot, but you get paid to go to school. Um, so kind of some resources for, to help you guys. Um, and the, the conference has these slides so you can get the webs, the, the links. Um, one is the C perch. It's, it's just kits that are readily available. Um, you can make an underwater ROV. You have Google Cardboard, um, which is actually pretty great. Um, it allows you to take like an old cardboard box from Amazon or whatever um, to make virtual reality glasses. Um, and you can use a lot of apps to actually go that are already readily available through Google, just on the, the app store, to fly through space, to take tours of museums and everything like this. Um, one of the other things with Google Cardboard, uh, especially for more advanced students, um, or if you want to kind of take it that way, you can actually make your own virtual reality uh, Google Cardboard lets you work and kind of record record your own virtual reality and then share it with others. So that's that could be an interesting project. Um, what's interesting is that virtual reality is actually being used for training purposes a lot in my field. Um, so what happens is you actually have ship captains learning how to drive. Um, these massive ships through very tiny ports, uh, through virtual reality. You have technicians learning what the inside of a wind turbine looks like before they ever step onto one of these platforms. Um, so it's a great tool. Uh, and Google Cardboard has paid and free. Um, so it could be you know, pretty nice exposure. Um, the other one, uh, maybe for for younger kids is the silver. Uh, it's just, you can just make a lot of different robots um, and it's renewable, it's solar. So that's also why I like it. <laughs> um, some free online resources. 
um, that I that I highly recommend. Uh, it's a website called Instructables. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite websites if you want to figure out how to build something or need an idea. This place is great, and it's 100% what it's made for. Um, so they have classes from everything from 3D printing to rocket making to cheese making. Um, it also has a lot of classes on solar and renewable, um, which, you know, I like. Uh, so, you know, it can do everything from, you know, help with science fair projects, and it could also help potentially uh, with... I know a lot of them might have to be doing uh, kind of digital learning. Um, so it offers step-by-step -step instructions um, and a community help board. Uh, so if you do run into problems, um, one of the things, it, it also offers contests and challenges. Um, so you get a lot of recognition for that and uh, it's just a fun community. Uh, it does have a site very specifically for teachers where you can pick your student's age range. Uh, and it will suggest um, different activities. Um, some of the material, you know, and it, it has projects from materials and items that you can just find in your house to other items where maybe you have to run to Home Depot or buy them online. So it's it's a great site to, to check out. Um, the other item, or the other site that I really like uh, and highly recommend that's free is called Scratch. Um, what it is, it's a programming language site. Um, so programming language is changing, um, especially as more and more people need to be introduced and used programming. Um, it's changing from, you know, the typical code that you see up top to something more like the bottom. It's visual programming where you kind of drag and drop your action items. And so what this does, it was made by MINT, uh, and it's purposely made to teach kids the beginning of programming. It allows them to play games, uh, but also see inside how the games were made. Uh, you can make your own games, you can go into competitions. Um, great thing for educators is that um, they have a site very specific for educators, and it offers uh, curriculums. For educators where you can follow through it offers step-by-step uh, -step instructions for kids to actually make these programs um, and it offers a lot of samples and and just stuff to kind of start the introduction to what is programming um, and, and could be a very fun way to be interactive uh, other one great one YouTube <laughs> everybody loves YouTube um, my favorite is um, there's a wind turbine prototype that EABW is actually sponsoring. Uh, so you can actually see the link there. But if you just actually put wind turbine um, or offshore floating wind in the search bar, you can actually see some pretty impressive operations. Um, other one is Bill Nye the Science Guy. He's, I know he's from my generation, but I still love him. Uh, and so you can actually watch all of his episodes. Um, and, you know, he has a lot of experiments that he does as well. Um, the other great show is How's, How Is It Made? Uh, and so that's also available on YouTube. But I just wanted to provide kind of some just resources for you guys um, as well with who I am. So that's pretty much my presentation. Uh, thanks for, for listening.